Greetings YouTubers, and welcome to the fourth in my series on geochronology or determining the age of the Earth. My name is PhD Tony, and today we're going to be talking about cosmogenic exposure ages. Cosmogenic dating focuses on using three interconnected physical processes. 1. The accumulation of exotic isotopes in Earth's atmosphere or in rock surfaces on Earth's surface due to the impact of cosmic rays. 2. The rates of erosion and sediment transport and storage, which in turn determine the relative abundance of these exotic isotopes at various points on Earth's surface. And 3. The relative rates of radioactive decay of those isotopes that are cosmogenically produced. The term cosmic ray is generally used to refer to high-energy charged particles that are non-terrestrial in origin. There are three broad categories of cosmic rays. Solar energetic particles that are produced by our Sun, galactic cosmic rays that are produced within our galaxy, the Milky Way, or extragalactic cosmic rays which have sources outside of our galaxy. There remains some uncertainty about the ultimate origin of cosmic rays. It is, however, currently thought that they are produced in supernovae, and in the cores of extremely energetic galaxies such as quasars. But from a geochronological perspective, the originating process is of no significance. Because they carry an electric charge, the trajectories followed by cosmic rays are influenced by any magnetic fields that they may encounter. We can reconstruct in at least some detail the geometry of the galactic and intergalactic magnetic fields due to polarization of light passing through dust clouds. These fields are, however, relatively weak and do not vary significantly over short timescales. At the top of Earth's atmosphere, it is the magnetic fields of the Sun and the Earth that have the most influence on the trajectories of cosmic rays. When the combined effects of these magnetic fields is weak, there will be more cosmic rays entering Earth's atmosphere than when they are strong. We observe that both magnetic fields vary significantly over a variety of timescales and we therefore conclude that the flux of cosmic rays into Earth's atmosphere will vary accordingly. And careful analysis of the sedimentary record proves that our conclusion is correct. The relative abundance of cosmogenic isotopes is closely related to the strength of both the solar magnetic field and Earth's magnetic field. Any cosmic ray travelling towards Earth's surface will enter Earth's atmosphere and start to experience collisions with gas molecules. As a result of these collisions, they will be disassembled into a variety of subatomic particles. This rain of subatomic debris is referred to as secondary cosmic rays. The rate of cosmic ray collisions with gas particles increases as air pressure increases, so that objects near Earth's surface are very much protected from the more deleterious effects of cosmic rays. As one would expect, within the atmosphere, the majority of cosmic ray collisions are with oxygen and nitrogen. And these collisions produce exotic isotopes through a process called spallation. A similar process called spoliation occurs within rocks where cosmic rays interact with isotopes of oxygen, silicon, aluminium, magnesium and iron. From a geochronological perspective there are seven primary isotopes in which we are interested that are listed in the table on the left here. As I mentioned previously, the analysis of carbon-14 is particularly complicated and I will discuss that in its own episode. Of the remaining six exotic isotopes that are produced by cosmogenic processes, two of them, helium-3 and neon-21, are completely stable and do not undergo radioactive decay. Of the remaining four, argon-39 has the shortest half-life of 269 years, while beryllium-10 has a half-life of 1.5 million years. The latter isotope, beryllium-10, turns out to be a singularly useful geological marker. There are multiple cosmogenic processes that lead to the production of beryllium-10, one such as illustrated in the figure in this slide, where a neutron impacts the nucleus of an oxygen-16 atom. Collisions of this sort may occur with oxygen atoms located in the crystalline structure of rocks, or oxygen molecules located in the atmosphere. Atmospheric or meteoric beryllium-10 quickly binds to dust particles and is then deposited in a variety of sedimentary records. None of these half-lives is long enough that these materials can be used for particularly deep geological time, but for more recent events they turn out to be very useful indeed. Consider a simple solid rock surface on Earth. Such a rock surface will be impacted by cosmic rays. As a result, cosmogenic nuclides will accumulate within the rock. But there's only so far into solid rock that cosmic rays can penetrate, so the cosmogenic isotopes will be concentrated near the outer surface of the rock. But if there's a major erosion event that removes the cosmogenic isotope layer, then the rock surface will appear pristine. 
So now we've got a very useful geological tool, because if there's a lot of erosion, then there can't be much in the way of cosmogenic nuclides in the sample. Conversely, if we see a high concentration of cosmogenic nuclides, then the sample can't have been eroded much. So analysis of cosmogenic nuclides provides us with a tool for quantifying the rate of erosion in different geological settings. A wide array of erosional processes have been applied to Earth's surface, some of which are illustrated here. With the aid of cosmogenic analysis, we can now quantify the rate at which these various processes can impact different geological formations. Conversely, it can occur that a rock surface that has been exposed and has cosmogenic isotopes in its outermost layer is buried somehow. During the period of burial, the stable cosmogenic isotopes will remain unchanged, but the radioactive cosmogenic isotopes will begin to decay, each in proportion to its half-life. Careful analysis of the relative abundances of cosmogenic isotopes can be used to untangle some of the details of previous burial and exhumation processes. It should by now be obvious that analysis of cosmogenic nuclide abundances allows us to reconstruct Earth's recent geological history in extraordinary detail. There is accordingly an extensive peer-reviewed literature dedicated to its use and its application to a wide variety of geological problems. The only reason this technique hasn't been subjected to a barrage of ignorant young Earth creationist attempts to discredit it is because they simply don't know that it exists. Should they happen to learn of its existence, they will doubtless go to their default argument, well, everything just happened a lot faster in the past. From the movement of tectonic plates to the formation of ice sheets, everything was just really, really quick because God made it do that. Surely the same technique will work here, won't it? In short, the answer is no. The problem is that multiple geological processes need to be synchronized. Way back in episode 2, I discussed ice cores, tree rings, and fluvial and marine sediment records. Careful chemical analysis allows us to reconstruct cosmogenic isotope abundances in each of these records. It turns out that where the records chronologically overlap, the agreement between them is extremely close. This allows us to identify contemporaneous layers in each record, that is, layers that formed when environmental conditions were the same. So let's consider the Young Earth Creationist position. In each of these records, the Young Earth Creationists claim that the early layers were formed very rapidly indeed. But the more rapidly these layers form, the less time there is for pollen, or dust, or microorganisms to accumulate in each layer. As a result, we would expect that in the deeper layers, there is less dust, less pollen, and fewer microorganisms to be found. But that isn't what's observed. Sure, there are some small fluctuations, but nothing as dramatic as what we would expect from the Young Earth Creationist timeline. Predictably, the Young Earth Creationists will respond by saying, well, the dust, the pollen, and the microorganisms were all deposited faster. But that claim directly contradicts the observational evidence available to us. We're going to start by turning our attention to one of the pieces of observational evidence that the Young Earth Creationists are most fond of, the Grand Canyon. The Young Earth Creationist position is that this spectacular geological feature was formed at the end of the deluge, as the waters of the biblical flood receded. This claim is in and of itself inconsistent with the observational evidence. Such an event would be extremely energetic and completely inconsistent with the sinuous meandering course of the Colorado River as it passes through this region. Under this hypothesis, the Grand Canyon was incised incredibly quickly, and thus the rock surfaces on the walls of the canyon should all have the same exposure age. In stark contrast, mainstream earth science theory suggests that the incision of the Grand Canyon was a very gradual process. Under this scenario, we expect that the exposure ages obtained for rocks at high elevation above the river should be much older than the ages obtained for rocks that are at low elevation above the river. We now have two different hypothetical predictions that we can compare against the observational data. To test these two competing hypotheses, we can send a geoscientist out into the field to sample the rock faces at various elevations above the modern river. Doing so, we find that the observational data is utterly inconsistent with the Young Earth Creationist hypothesis, but completely consistent with the traditional Earth science interpretation. We can apply exactly the same analytical techniques to other erosional settings. For instance, at the northern edge of the Bay of Bengal, there is a fluvial sedimentary layer that is more than 10 kilometers thick. 
In order for such a sedimentary layer to have accumulated under the Young Earth Creationist timeline, regional erosional rates need to be extremely high, and correspondingly, cosmogenic exposure ages should be extremely low. Yet again, the observational data does not support this conclusion. Instead, we observe cosmogenic exposure ages ranging from many tens of thousands to many hundreds of thousands of years across this region, directly contradicting the Young Earth hypothesis. Similarly, cosmogenic results from other geological provinces are utterly inconsistent with the Young Earth creationist timeline. So that's where I'm going to draw a line under cosmogenic exposure age dating today. Just to recap what we've covered, cosmic rays enter Earth's atmosphere and collide with atomic nuclei to form exotic isotopes. This occurs both in the atmosphere and in the exposed surfaces of rocks. Sustained exposure to cosmic rays will result in an accumulation of these exotic isotopes within the impacted samples. This accumulation may be interrupted by periods of burial or offset by episodes of erosion and sediment transport. Careful analysis of the relative abundances of these cosmogenic isotopes can be used to determine how long a given sample has been exposed to cosmic rays. The same results can be used to constrain how much erosion the sample has experienced. Neither the erosion rates nor the exposure ages are found to be consistent with the Young Earth timeline, bringing us back to the conclusion that this hypothesis is not supported by the available evidence. Just before I let you go, I want to quickly explore the Young Earth creationist suggestion that if they just speed everything up, all of the problems with their chronology will disappear. The essential problem for Young Earth creationists is that you can't just speed stuff up. It often just doesn't work. Let's take the case of glacial erosion. It would seem sensible to suppose that if you just make the ice sheet thicker, there should be more erosion. But it doesn't work like that. The thicker you make the ice sheet, the more gravitationally unstable it becomes and the more it wants to flow, and the more that flow occurs away from the bedrock interface. Weakening the bedrock won't solve the problem, because in that case the ice sheet simply won't form because the bedrock cannot sustain enough stress to withstand that lateral flow. Why am I bringing this up? Well, it turns out that there is a phase in Earth's geological history that poses a significant problem for young Earth creationists. In Australia, California, Oman, Namibia, China, and a number of other locations around the globe, we see quite significant diamictite layers. Diamictites form at the edges of large ice sheets, but they require sustained periods of glacial erosion in order to exist. Boring old mainstream science attributes these diamictite layers to the Huronian glaciation, a period of global glacial coverage that lasted for at least 100 million years, plenty of time for these geological remnants to form. It is by no means clear when in the Young Earth narrative these layers were formed. Doubtless, young Earth creationists will come up with some stupid excuse, but it does seem quite strange that none of the civilizations that existed near Oman chose to mention that there was a filthy great ice sheet on their doorstep. Even worse, these inconveniently thick diamictite layers are overlain by tens of metres of cap carbonates. These cap carbonates were clearly deposited in a marine environment, and here again we run into a process that simply cannot be accelerated. The rate of precipitation of calcium carbonate at the bottom of the ocean is strictly limited by the amount of calcium and bicarbonate ions available. These, in turn, are limited by other considerations. There's only so much carbon dioxide we can have in the atmosphere and still have the atmosphere breathable. There's only so much bicarbonate that we can have in the oceans and still have the oceans livable. This process cannot be accelerated to the point that the atmosphere is unbreathable and the oceans are unlivable. In order for calcium carbonate to form at the rate required to match the young Earth narrative would mean that Earth was simply uninhabitable, which directly contradicts the biblical version of events. Okay, so that's where I'm going to call it for today, for real this time. Thank you so much for watching, I do hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you'll join me next time when I will be discussing the most venerable of modern geochronological techniques, radiocarbon dating.